can't believe that we're here in person. Did you see that? What? Yeah, I mean, who, who here was uh, trying to be uh, joining us for the 2020, uh, Ohaso? Yeah, remember? So we were, I was literally packing almost when, uh, when we didn't make it. Um, interesting times. Okay, I'm jet lagged. So uh, anything I say should not be taken against me, right? Uh, but, uh, but also I am jet lagged um, because, uh, because we're traveling again. And I have to say I was uh, on this uh, flight thinking about um, what happened. Have, 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 you, have you guys uh, actually taken the time to reflect on the last two years? Yeah? I'm going to ask you to do something as we, as we start. Um, I want us to reflect not on the events of the last two years, okay? I want you to take a minute or two and reflect on the list of emotions you felt over the last two years, okay? Uh, it's not uh, they said that and the prime minister did this and j just list down all of the different emotions you felt through the two years. Can, can you do that? Let's take two minutes to do this. positive ones as well as negative ones. <clears throat> Anyone had frustration so far? Okay, yeah. Panic, did anyone panic? Yeah, fear, anxiety. Anyone had uh, optimism? Amazing. Connection? Yeah, right? Peace. Anyone have peace? Interesting, huh? I'm, I'm going to give you 30 seconds more. Search deep, huh? It's not the events, it's how you felt. Wouldn't waste two minutes, but I'm jet lagged, so. <laughs> It's better that you do the thinking than I do. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I, I'd really urge you to do this, please. No? When you have time, uh, actually sit down and reflect on the emotions, okay? How you felt through that uh, incredible period, which I think was a mega gift for humanity, if you think about it. But, but do, you, do you realize that the, the diversion of emotions huh, that, was, that were felt in this room between panic and frustration on one side to optimism and peace on the other side. And probably on your own list, there were quite a few of those emotions, right? So there were times when you were very optimistic and times where you believed that the world was going to end. Anyone here believed that COVID was gonna end the world? Yeah, right? Anyone here still believes that something else happening today called World War III is gonna end the world? Interesting, right? Have you noticed that we don't even hear about COVID anymore? Okay, it somehow fizzled. It wasn't like someone woke up one day and said, okay, that's it, that's the end of the COVID period, we're not gonna talk about it again. Okay, uh, there are still people getting diagnosed, there are still people that we lose, but it's just not in the media. Did you notice that? Okay, and because it's not in the media, it's not on top of your mind. And because it's not on top of your mind, it's not part of your world. Have you noticed that? I want to come back to this uh, when, when we speak uh, later about some solutions. Hmm? But here's the thing. Hmm? The thing is, some of us would take an event like COVID and, and all of us at a point in time and turn it into the world is going to end. I'll tell you what I did. Hmm? When, I, when, I, when COVID started, uh, it was to me, and I know maybe my brain is a little... Uh, strange, but I, it was the first time in my life where I didn't have to travel three to four weeks of every five. Okay, 
And in all selfishness, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing, right? And, and basically what I did is I, uh, I wrote a book, Scary Smart, that came out uh, uh, last September. I wrote two more books that are already finished, uh, that little voice in your head coming out in May and Unstressable coming out in November. And I wrote two more books are halfway through. Thank you. Uh, I hope you like them. Uh, which one, one is uh, Finding Love About Love and Relationships and another uh, is called Half Monk. And just the enormous, I started slow-mo. I don't know how many of you have been listening to slow-mo. It's now a top, uh, uh, top 200 uh, global podcast. And it is just, it was to me, it was incredible. Really, it was the, probably one of the best periods of my life. And of course, unlike what you think about me, I'm a very serious introvert. So it was heaven. It was an absolute heaven for me, right? To the point that when they let us out after the first lockdown, I sort of volunteered to lock myself down, okay? I really did. I was like, okay, you know, I'm busy, so I can't really meet anyone. And, and when, you, when you think about that, you start to understand some, like a couple of things that I really want you to dig deep and understand. One is, believe it or not, if I had told you to list the events of what happened, okay, you would not have been able to list a single event that had not triggered an emotion in you. Please reflect on that. Okay? Our memories are made up of stories that have triggered emotions. Our computers up here, they do not log a memory unless it triggers an emotion. Basically, the way our brain works is it wants a database, a pattern recognition machine of all of the different emotions we feel associated with events. Okay? I, I, uh, I interviewed uh, Ludovico uh, uh, a, a, a Naudi, the pianist, uh, to be out hopefully on Slow Mo next Sunday. And Lodovico was, I was telling him, how do you make your music make us feel? And he says, I have an inventory of emotions that are associated with musical vocabulary in my mind. So when my mother played this, I felt that. And so I understood in my mind, in my heart, uh, that, that E minor will trigger that emotion in me. So when I write again, I take that emotion. I'm, I'm feeling that emotion I would write in E minor, okay? So, so when you think about it, hmm, that's what our brains do. Our brains are supposed to be pattern recognition machines that are protecting us. So if I felt panic and panic was associated with an event pattern that looked like this, I would log that event pattern so that I understand what panic is. And so if other events match that, I would panic too. Okay, interesting, huh? This is one thing. The other thing is this. Hmm? Every time you felt one of those emotions, what you logged in your memory was not really what happened. Do you realize that? What, what you logged in your memory was what you think happened. You've never actually in your life logged anything at all. Hmm? There is no reality there is no reality in our world unless you turn it into a thought and the thought is your reality. Do you understand the complexity of this? Okay, the world does not exist. It only exists inside your head. Okay, so I'm looking at you now and some of you are taking notes. Okay, and I'm thinking, okay, in my head, they like what I'm saying. Okay. If I, may, if I come closer, you might be scribbling saying, I wish this will end, right? Okay, that's the truth, huh? But my brain would say they like what I'm saying. My brain would not say they were scribbling. Do you understand this? Okay, my brain would make up a story based on that observation that says, I think, that's my thought pattern, that they like what I'm saying. Now, when you realize that, you start to understand why I have notes because I'm jet lagged. <laughs> Did you see this? Uh, when, you, when, you, when you realize that, you start to understand why certain events trigger some of us in a certain way and others in a different way. Why the same event would trigger you sometimes in a certain way and sometimes in another way. The example I keep saying is my brilliant daughter, Aya. Aya is incredibly brilliant. I, I wish you guys will meet her one day. 
And Aya hmm, failed mathematics. I think it was second, uh, secondary, like grade nine or something like that. Failed. She completely failed the entire year. Hmm? And Aya's life itself, Aya is life, okay? And she came home and she was still smiling. And even though most of you know that on top of my happy list is I, I feel happy when I see my kids smile, hmm? I felt very upset. It's the same event, right? My daughter is smiling. Hmm? But my mind translates this into I as irresponsible. It's not the truth at all. Okay? As a matter of fact, as a happiness practitioner myself now, I, if I look back at that time, I would have probably smiled myself. Because you know what? Frowning wouldn't, wouldn't have changed a thing. Right? She, so she knew in reality, oops, that went bad. I'm going to fix it. Life is okay. Right? In my mind, the story that my brain logged was my daughter is irresponsible. Okay, now those stories are the reason why I wrote my next book, That Little Voice in Your Head. And, and that little voice in your head, so it's out May 26th, it's available for pre-ordering now for international English, US hopefully next month, uh, US and Canada. Uh, and, and it is a complex book, I don't, I don't know if you're gonna like it. So it's, it's written, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious, I, I, I allowed myself to be the real engineer, okay? So Solve for Happy was a bit, interpreted from my, in, I mean, if I was writing Solve for Happy, as you know, tech geeks will say, trying to summarize it in my engineering head, the book would be one page that says 42, right? So that's, you know, that's how we think of life. But, you know, uh, so that little voice is a little more, we call it a workshop manual. A workshop manual is, is really what the techies use if you give them, uh, you know, a broken car, for example. They will open the workshop manual and say, okay, so here is what's going wrong. It could probably be this valve or that hose. And then they would fix that valve and that hose. So that little voice is like that. It is 400 pages long, and it is an analogy between computer science and neuroscience. In my attempt to say, and this is ridiculous when you think about it, in my attempt to say that we humans have actually mastered the use of our computers in the modern world more than we've mastered the use of our brains. Okay, so for me to enable you to understand how your brain work, I'm creating analogies to your computer. Can you believe that? Huh? So we humans know when our computers misbehave, but we don't know when our brains misbehave. And that little voice is an attempt to tell you, oh, that's a bug, or this is a loop, or this is, you know, uh, 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 some kind of a battery or a memory overload or whatever. Now, the, the main premise here is, if nothing ever happens until it happens inside your head, then if we can, and if we can fix the way your head behaves, okay, then we can change a lot of things. Because you know what? The events of the world are not going to change. Do you understand that? So the, the events of the world, so there is a war taking place in the world today. You can get up, all of you, hit your heads against that wall for seven hours, nothing's gonna change. Do you realize that? You can take that like Allah did yesterday and think about it more holistically, more differently, and instead of creating emotions of panic or emotions of hate or emotions of anger or so on and so on, you could create emotions of compassion, of empathy. You could create emotions of uh, responsibility and accountability. You could engage, you could do different things not because the world has changed, but because the way you processed the information, your software, if you want, ran the information differently. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, actually give us a lot of time for conversation. So what I'll do is I'll take you through a very specific example of that, uh, and then we open up for questions. I'll, I'll start from the happiness equation because it's the basis of everything that I do. If you remember, I basically say that um, our brains are constantly engaged in one thing only, believe it or not. My belief is that, yes, we've stretched our brains to create iPhones and stuff like that and have conversations like this. But the reality of the main reason for that biological organ is it's attempting to constantly monitor the environment around you, okay, so that it sees if there is something that contradicts its, its perception of the optimum uh, state for your survival. So it's simply constantly looking at the world around you and saying, oh, she smiled, that's a good sign. Oh, she frowned, that doesn't mean it's good. 
Okay? And that analysis is summarized in my view in the happiness equation, which is events minus expectations. That your unhappiness is the result of moments where the event or your perception of the event misses your expectations of how life should be. Okay? And events minus expectations, as I said many times before, if you take, and I, I did a lot of analysis in that little voice about that, if you take the way our brains actually tick, like a computer processor, so they literally tick, they go, tick, I can do a transaction, tick, I can do another transaction, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you take that, you can actually run that equation in your brain up to 60,000 times a day. And for many of us, we do. The ones that wake up at 3.30 a.m., right? It's the truth, huh? and it's not, it's not a bad thing. Huh? I mean, Karen is waking up because it's a big day. All of you are here. You know, they're, you're, you're our guests. We love to have you here. We love to make you happy, right? And so there are thoughts happening, and we have. You know, eight hours of sleep is a good third of the 60,000 uh, ticks. So if I wake up a little early, I can add 10,000 ticks. I can think about it, you know, 10,000 times more. And so with those 60,000 times, what's happening for us is that we're constantly engaged in that comparison. And the biggest eye-opener for me at a point in time was, uh, unlike what we are told, by the way, when we're taught to meditate. Hmm? So when we're taught to meditate, we're taught to, um, to silence the brain. Okay? We're supposed to say, calm down, you annoying bee. You know, we don't want all of that noise. Calm down, stop thinking. Right? And by the way, I think that's wonderful. Those moments of complete silence are some of the best moments we've ever lived. And then I hosted one of my favorite monks on the planet, became my very dear friend, Galing, Galing Tupton, who is the sort of the prominent monk in the UK. And Galing was like, that's not the objective at all. Okay? This is like going to the gym. Hmm? You're going to the gym not to, um, you know, the gym in itself is not the purpose. The purpose is to be fit. Right? And so in his explanation, he basically said, it's that moment where you pull your brain down from noise to silence, that's the, that's the biceps curve. Right? This is the exercise that makes your brain capable of going from noise to silence. Okay? But being in the gym itself, being in meditation itself is not the purpose. It's that skill that you're learning. It's that reconfiguration, rewiring of your brain, if you want. Okay? And so accordingly, it's quite interesting when you think about it, because if that's the case, hmm, then silencing your brain is amazing when it's supposed to be silenced, okay? But it's actually the wrong thing if you're supposed to be thinking, okay? And if you can think positive thoughts, then think away. Use the entire 60,000 ticks. Do you understand? It's not a bad thing to think a positive thought. We need that skill of silencing the brain so that if we're overwhelmed thinking negative thoughts, we can say, hey, hold on, observe your breathing, observe something real in the real world, and come back down so that we can discuss this objectively, brain. Okay? So when you think about the happiness equation, those ticks, hmm, uh, events minus expectations triggering unhappiness, it hits me that this is actually simply a survival mechanism. When you really think about it, what your brain is attempting to do is to alert you when things are not optimal for your survival. Okay? So if the news tells you the pandemic is out there, we're all going to die, your brain goes like, whoa, we're all going to die. Amazing. Let me see how I can panic about this. Okay? Right? When in reality, you know, some of us will say, oh my God, we're going to die, I need to write quicker, right? So, you know, it's, it, it's interesting how we think about this, right? It's the same trigger. Now, if you compare that to a survival mechanism, then the biggest analogy I can give you is a comparison to the uh, fire alarms, right? And because that's very visual. So, your brain looks at the world around it. You, you know, I see that you're not smiling enough. I go like, oh, I'm really screwing up, okay? And it's a fire alarm. My brain goes, right? It's very noisy, it's very annoying. It's constantly telling me that something is wrong, okay? When the fire alarm goes on, or it goes off, is the right English word, uh, what do we do? Because if you, if you use that analogy, life becomes really simple, okay? And one of the things that I really think have really been received well when I started to talk about it from that little voice in your head, 
is that the way we react to fire alarms is not the way we react to unhappiness. Okay, and so maybe if I can give you a flow chart, because this is a computer, that you can follow when the fire alarm is triggered, you may actually come back to happiness a lot more quicker, a lot more often. And the, and the, and the flow chart is very straightforward. When you really think about it, it's actually really simple. What happens if the fire alarm, go, alarm goes off? We will all get up, we will go outside, we will check if there is a fire, and then we will take action. Isn't that what happens? Right? If we sat down here with the fire alarm going, it would be quite noisy, quite annoying, and we might die. Right? But when it comes to unhappiness, that's exactly what we do. Right? Your partner tells you something hurtful on Friday, you sit down on Saturday and go like, okay, let's play that again. Right? Let me torture myself. It's like almost the fire alarm is stopped. Okay? So you take a lighter and you go like, no, no, I like that noise. Right? Interesting, huh? Yet, there is another way. And the other way, so I, I basically say, from the moment you found the trigger of your unhappiness, and you know, the trigger of your unhappiness is really found in your feeling. Huh? The fire alarm of us is not noisy, it just makes us feel. This is why I said, re reflect on what you felt. Hmm? In the modern world, of course, we demonize feeling because it makes us vulnerable. So no, 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 hold on, I don't feel anything, I'm fine, right? Now I'm trying to say, of, of course, if you feel, please do not only acknowledge that you feel, embrace that you feel, okay? And then I want you to do one trick, and the trick is very simple. Hmm? It's not what your brain is telling you that happened. We want to find the trigger. The trigger is, hmm, uh, you know, uh, as I said, um, it's not that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not panicking because there is an, a tiger standing in front of me trying to kill me. I'm panicking because they told me COVID is going to get me. Okay? And so the thought in my head is I'm going to die. Yeah, if that's the thought, then of course you have to be afraid. Right? But when you get that thought, I ask you to go through a flow chart. And the flow chart is made of three simple questions. Question number one is, is it true? Is it true, brain? Okay? And is it true, media? Is it true, social media? Okay? Is it true that the world is going to end? Is it true? Is it true that your partner doesn't love you anymore? Okay? Is it true that you're not safe? I mean, look at you. You're so safe. It's honestly, beautifully safe. We're here, we're discussing happiness, life is good, okay? But your brain can choose one element of the scenario and say, not something is wrong. And when, when your brain says something, sadly, we believe it. We sadly believe it, okay? So my first question on the flow chart is very straightforward. If my brain tells me something, I know in my heart that it's not the event. It's my brain's interpretation of the event. So the first thing I do is I say, is this true? Is this true, brain? Is it true that Aya doesn't love me anymore? Okay? If it's not true, drop it. Because what is the point wasting your life on something that is not even true and making yourself miserable about it? Right? If it is true, then it's time for question number two. And question number two is very straightforward. Very straightforward. The reason why your brain alerts you that something is wrong is because it wants you to do something about it. Okay? Your brain is saying, hey, by the way, your partner doesn't love you anymore because you care about your partner. Your, partner is say, your brain is saying, maybe we should talk to him or her. Maybe we should you know, uh, uh, investigate what went wrong. It was so wonderful. Why is it falling? Right? So if it is true, as I said, if it's not true, drop it. Huh? If it is true, ask yourself the second question, which is, what can I do about it? And what can I do about it, honestly, in my view, for engineers, this is why probably my happiness stream is a lot more consistent because I actually don't stay there. I am so action oriented. When something triggers me, I go like, okay, so what can I do about it? Yeah, if Aya doesn't actually love me, that's a very serious topic that sitting in the corner and crying is not gonna change. You realize that, right? So I could cry about it for 16 hours, nothing's gonna change. The point is, if Aya doesn't, or if it's true that Aya doesn't love me, I need to call her and say, baby, I love you so much. You're my love of my life. What did I do wrong? I'm willing to change, right? If your partner doesn't love you, you may as well make a call and say, hey, F off. I'm going to look for one more of the 3.4 billion others 
you know, and, and, and life is okay, right? It's action somehow, right? Hmm? It's action. And so if, it, if it's true, the question you need to ask is, what am I going to do about it? If there is some, something you can do about it, do it. Do it. Don't waste your life on unhappiness, okay? And when you do it, the unhappiness will go away for two reasons. One is because your life is going to be better, and two is because the parts of your brain that are responsible for problem solving are not the parts of your brain that are responsible for incessant thinking. Okay, so you're literally going to move the problem from the part that's making you unhappy to the part that will make you happy. Immediately, even before you start doing it, once you start planning what you're going to do, you're in a good place. The third, which is, I think, the most interesting is, but sometimes in life there are things that are true and that I can do nothing about. Russia attacking Ukraine. Me losing my child. Okay, uh, um, you know, rain in the UK. Something like that. You cannot do anything about them. And if that's the case, then it goes back to question number three. And question number three, in my view, is the Jedi Master level of happiness. Being happy in tough times. Okay? And being happy in tough times is very straightforward. Once again, it goes back to the concept of, by the way, if I'm unhappy, it's not going to make it any less tough. Hmm? So I might as well accept it as it is. I might as well accept that the world has cruelty in it. Okay? You know, I might as well accept that, yeah, relationships sometimes break. I might as well accept that, yeah, sometimes we die. And sometimes the one that dies is your child, not your father. Right? And when you accept it, you're not doing that from a place of weakness. You're doing it from a place of strength. Because once you accept it, okay, you can start to do something that makes your life better despite its presence. Or as a matter of fact, sometimes because of its presence. So the reason I'm standing in front of you is because Ali left our world, my son, right? So that's the idea of saying, I call that committed acceptance. Committed acceptance is, yes, there is something awful happening in our world. But instead of sitting back and complaining and, and, and you know, killing ourselves with unhappiness, maybe we should trigger the other emotion and say, we have the compassion to try and go out and help. We have the compassion to try and reach out and make those people feel a little better. We have the compassion to do other things that will make the life of us in the future better so that this doesn't happen as often as it does. And with that, I think, with that flow chart, if you train yourself through it, through neuroplasticity, most of the time you'll bounce back from unhappiness to happiness, I say, within seven seconds. Can you believe that? Can you believe that if you train yourself to go through this, is it true? Can I do something about it? Can I commit and accept? That process of the flow chart is seven seconds might as well be worth the training. So I have run over time. I feel miserable, but I'm jet lagged. So anyway, uh, th can we have questions maybe for a few? Yeah. Questions? Right here. Yes. Thank you so much. It's not necessarily a question. It's a comment for you and for everybody. I want to share briefly my shift of perception during the pandemic. When it started, I was defeated. I was like, this cannot be possible. Somebody invented this against me. Yeah. <laughs> and all women in the world. Personalized, yeah. Yeah, I was total victim, miserable, hating everybody from my mom to my husband to my two-year-old. Yes. And one day, after six months of misery, Thanks to a writing prompt from Tri Global, shout out to Jen Fisher, whatever she is. Uh, thanks to a writing prompt that I received from Tri Global, they asked, How could you ease your pandemic fatigue? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Ease? <laughs> I haven't used that word in months, but I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it. And all it took for me to realize that I was a caregiver. Yeah. I wasn't a writer, a coach, a speaker, I was a caregiver. I was a daughter, a wife, a mom. How beautiful. And it was like this. I haven't complained ever since. And yes. 18 months have happened. <laughs> so I still thank you. And it's just, it's just doing exercises like that, doing yeah. a flowchart, changing like, what am I complaining about? <laughs> it, so isn't it amazing? You. This is, I mean, see, thank you so much for sharing this. Isn't it amazing? Huh? No, normally, by the way, for most of us, huh, when we shift from unhappiness to happiness, it's not because the world has changed. You realize that, okay? It's literally a moment where you see the world differently. You suddenly go like, hold on. 
there's something I'm missing. And when you see it, it changes everything. Hey, Mo, thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, so there's a lot of research going on about the little worlds in the head, especially in the world of psychedelics. Um, MDMA, assisted psychotherapy, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy, and was shown in the panels. Just like you remove bugs out of computers, um, you need something from the external side. It's interesting we're all here looking for answers to happiness when what you were saying and what was spoken about yesterday, we all have the answers inside us. Mm -hmm. We just need the tools to find them. What is your opinion? Before everyone starts panicking, looking at tools to stop that little voice in the head of talking to that wolf. What are some of the effective top two or three tools besides the wonderful flow chart you just talked about that can help us not stop the voice, but channel it correctly? My God, that's like a four hours to answer. Uh, <laughs> four, 400 pages for sure. Um, I, um, I think you covered so many points. You don't want me to talk about psychedelics and external stuff because I have a very special view on that. Uh, good, okay, so let's avoid that. Uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the, there are many tools, but they are really categorized into uh, two parts, okay? And the two parts are probably, I think before, the, I, you know, uh, uh, Andrea was talking about what you will want to, to remember on your deathbed. I'm hoping that before I die, I will have shifted the, uh, the view of the world on the feminine and the masculine, okay? And, and it's very clear within me because I had serious, certain experiences that allowed me to live entirely in my feminine. And so in a very unusual way, my engineer's mind is able to explain some of that stuff. And I think the reality of the biggest issue we have in our unhappiness world, again, I can't cover the whole thing, but if you ask me for the top one, it's the ability to go between our feminine and our masculine, between being and doing, okay? Because we live in a world that sadly, even for those of us who are feminine, by the way, feminine is not woman. There are many men around here. Where's Nadim? Habibi. Uh, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, but no, I, in, in reality, I, so Nadim is a, one of my dear friends, and he's a, a straight man, but, but able to connect with his feminine, right? And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful attribute. The game for me has been that for most of us, there is a cycle that needs to happen in being, in becoming aware, okay? In really, really being in that moment and saying, that's how I feel. That's who I am. Have you, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard Dorota's uh, talk yesterday. That's who I am. That's wonderful, right? And then, but there are some things there that I can work on and I can change and I can heal and I can improve and I can enjoy and I can, right? That being cycle is missing for most of us. We, must, we most often go to the doing cycle. So even, even our happiness teachers will say, repeat a mantra, or they'll say, meditate or they'll say, do this, or they'll say, do that. We, we humans have lived in a world where doing is becoming the language we speak, okay? And my big ask of everyone has been, get back to being, okay? And that cycle between being and doing, so, so, uh, so that little voice in your head is built on a model that I call be, learn, do, okay? So be is to become aware of something. Learn is to learn the skills that you need to, uh, to, to affect it, and then do is to actually engage and change something about it. And I think this cycle, in my view, is probably one of the biggest reasons for unhappiness for two reasons. One is we, we mindlessly do things that we shouldn't probably do and that have very little effect. And the other is because we're not balanced, we're not grounded in the, in the balance between our feminine and masculine, between the balance between our being and doing. And I think that would change a lot of things if we achieve that. Thank you, Mo. Okay, so sometimes life happens really fast, events happen fast. And so the first step of, is it true in our brain? Can you talk about when things are happening so quickly that maybe you're not even noticing the thoughts? Mm. It's, things are happening fast in your home, work, and mm. you're not even in that space where you're noticing your thoughts. Mm. That's, that's an incredible uh, uh, part of the issue, actually. Right? So, so, as I said, it's a balance between be and do. It's a balance between be and do. And what do we wake up in the morning and do? We do, right? You wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you reach out to your phone, you read things, you do things, you respond to people, you run, you make coffee, right? None of us actually, or very few of us would wake up in the morning and be. Hmm? 
I wake up every morning and be. So my first half an hour of the day has no doing in it other than making the best cup of coffee on the planet, okay? Which I don't consider doing, to be honest. I actually consider it an exercise of being. Because I have never made the same coffee twice because I love coffee so much. I understand the fabric of coffee. So I would wake up in the morning and my first 15 minutes, I'm literally reflecting on how I feel. And which coffee fits that? Do I want a creamy, you know, uh, slightly sweet? Or do I want a strong boost? Do I want it cold? Do I want it warm? Do I want it a little bitter? Do I want it? And so on, right? And that exercise, believe it or not, is an exercise of meditation because it allows you to go outside your thoughts and into something that is real in the real world right but but my point here is this hmm? there are three layers at which again everything in my mind because of the engineering approach i call it beginners black belt and uh, jedi master level okay the, the 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 beginner's level is to allow yourself to feel that's the beginner's level Be believe it or not it's complex at that sound as that sounds it's the beginner's level so the beginner's level is to say to yourself, just like when you get an itchy throat, you tell yourself, mm, something's not right here, okay? And something is not right here basically means I need to stop and see if I need to have some vitamin C or rest today and so on. We feel those things. And part of my work in that little voice is to tell you that each emotion has a physical signature in you. You can actually feel it, sense it physically. Right? But the game here is, like your itchy throat, if you're a little angry, you need to stop everything. Literally, you need to stop everything and say, what's going on here? What am I feeling? That's number one. Right? Number two is the black belt level. The black belt level is to do this regularly. Okay? So regularly means you have certain intervals in the day where your alarm goes off and you stop and you say, how do I feel now? Am I tired? Is my neck hurting? You know, is this... Uh, 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 you know, I'm, am I uh, frustrated with my colleague and so on and so forth, right? The third level is to feel before you do, okay? The third level is what I'm trying to tell you, is, is you become, this is the Jedi master, is to, is to literally not do anything that's uninformed by your being, okay? Am I there yet? Of course not, but I strive to be there very frequently, okay? I strive to, um, you know, honestly, when, we, when, I, when I, I didn't know what I was going to talk about today until 5.30 a.m., Right? And I didn't allow myself, you know, uh, Munir, my, you know, my boss, really, my manager, the one that makes me uh, in front of you every day, told me, you're going to talk about that little voice in your head. And I'm like, yes, I know, but I don't know what I want to talk about. I don't know what I'm feeling. Right? And that idea of not allowing yourself to act before you be, okay, that's the Jedi, the Jedi master level. So, so what is the answer? Hmm? The answer is very straightforward. The answer is, refuse what the modern world is telling you to do. Refuse the constant doing, okay? Allow yourself the spaces, whether they're designed spaces, like I do when I make my coffee in the morning, or, you know, like your alarm goes off twice a day to say, stop and see how you feel, okay? Or, you know, allow yourself that space by making it the primary space. Primary space from which you first be, and by the way, the other step, huh, is maybe try to learn before you do, because if, you know, if your being is telling you to drive a sports car, you might as well take some lessons, right? And that, that, you know, most of the time we don't do that. So be before you learn, learn before you do. I think that's the answer. Thank you so much. <laughs>